Very big topic here. So we have Owen, of course, uh, joining us. And uh, Mr. Brian Beery. He's a contributing editor with the European Institute. Uh, good to see you. Good to see you again, Let me start with... Um, you know, a little bit of background for our audience here, because we often talk about open borders, and then we all talk about closed borders, and perhaps we're oversimplifying a bit. Within the EU, you can, you can move around quite easily, but if you're a foreigner trying to get into the EU, you still have to have borders. Is there a happy medium that countries like France could adopt? Uh, there is. Uh, the happy medium would be uh, in a situation where you have a major terrorist attack, that the internal uh, borders are... Um, uh, temporarily re-erected, as, as it were, um, so that when you're crossing from France to Belgium, um, uh, you may go through a, a check. Um, the idea of the sort of the pro-European dream is that that's a temporary measure. Um, what's difficult now is that certainly uh, politicians on the right of the political spectrum are saying that that should be permanent, that there just simply is not a way to uh, keep the terrorists yeah. but, but, from, from crossing. So, so here it is. I mean, you talk about the European dream, and I remember when the euro first got put into effect, and Owen, you remember this, this as well, was the spirit of Europe was that we were going to be collaborative, we were going to be together, there wouldn't be all these borders and fences. You have spent uh, plenty of time in Europe, including in, in Paris. I'm just, I want to get your your opinion on this, is it a good idea? Well, Phil, make no mistake, this is a, a really a retrograde step, as I said a moment ago. France and Germany founded this whole project on the basis that we'd have this one block that was completely open and transparent. And gradually we're seeing these borders going back up under pressure from this latest attack. It also will have a business impact as well. If we look at supply chains, for example, just think about how quick, quickly you can order goods from someone like Amazon these days. Well, if you're putting up borders in countries like, say, Spain and France and Germany, imagine a truck that has to pass through four countries, has to spend an hour at each of those borders. You're adding hours and hours of time. And these kinds of things eat into companies' bottom, line, bottom, line, bottom lines, particularly uh, when they have such a, a quick turnaround time to try and get these goods out. Uh, I mentioned a moment ago that the Dutch are saying that this would cost them alone around half a billion dollars a year. You multiply that by around 20 countries around Europe, and you're talking potentially about tens of billions of dollars in lost, uh, lost, lost money. This issue of migration has um, been a huge topic for Europe, including places where you wouldn't think it would be, in Switzerland, for example, where they're worried about migrants or immigrants coming over to, number one, there's the jobs issue. Number two, there's the crime issue that many people have been worried about. And so this isn't a new issue that just started last weekend. Are there methods that any one particular country has utilized that has been positive, that has worked? Uh, worked, depending on how you define work. The, the, the main point is that n you can't really stop the flow of people. So uh, one million this year, and that's despite the best efforts of all of these European countries um, trying to impose some kind of order. Uh, at one point, uh, Germany was saying that this was not all bad news because they needed uh, the extra labor um, in their market. Uh, the Paris attacks have probably changed the dynamic in that debate and put Germany and Chancellor Merkel on the defensive more. I mean, oh, and the background checks. I mean, you and I have talked about this a little bit before. What are they really background checking? Because the people coming across are not going to have all the same papers that you and I likely have. They're basically running away from hell, essentially. They've got nothing. They're lucky to have a passport on them. It's funny. I remember the days in the 90s, Phil, when I first went to France. You didn't have uh, the EU, as you know it then, and you had to get what was known as a carte de séjour, a sort of uh, a card that proved that you were a temporary resident. That's almost like the same situa situation now for these people coming in who aren't European passport holders. They have to go through that process. To your point on controls, well, again, that was the idea about an open Europe. Yes, you would have your passport, but the idea essentially was that you could get on a plane in somewhere like Spain and get off one in, in France without really having to show too much identification. Brian, where do we go from here in this argument? Because I, I see both sides, right? I see the side who wants open borders, and I see the side that wants to shut it all down, and you don't get across this until you go across the wall. I mean, those are the two extreme positions. What's the happy medium? I think the happy medium is that you... Uh, reintroduce temporary uh, border checks between the EU countries, depending on the security situation at the random moment. random checks or temporary checks? Uh, I would say t temporary checks um, in a very severe situation, such as we have now, but that they are lifted uh, when that particular crisis 
goes away. But the question is, uh, how long will this crisis go on for? The one I want to ask about the state of emergency. This this is something none of us are very familiar with, I, and I'm not saying you would be, but. I don't remember a time when a country has been in a state of emergency in Europe, at least, for, for what they're asking for now, three months. What are the economic implications and how might that affect uh, migration, for example? It's obviously going to, it feeds into this idea about putting up border controls. France hasn't declared a state of emergency for 50 years. That's how uh, old, if you like, and how out of date, you might say, some of this, uh, this kind, these kinds of measures are. The biggest problem will be those border controls, as I mentioned, those companies that depend on that free flow of goods around your, your Amazons, particularly these companies who have these very, very quick lead times to try and get their goods across Europe. They're the ones who are going to be harmed the most. Uh, remember, President Francois Hollande declared this state of emergency. The intention was that it would be a short-term short measure while France tries to recover from these attacks and certainly finds the people who are responsible for, for them. Brian, last word. What about the good ones coming across the border? Because we can't forget that we're talking about a very small minority percentage of, of those that we are worried about. The good ones, they might really be trapped in no man's land, right? Uh, yeah, indeed. Most of these people who are fleeing from Syria are fleeing ISIS. Um, so they're fleeing this kind of terrorism. But uh, that argument is uh, harder to make now, given that one of the attackers apparently registered as a refugee with a Syrian passport. So it just gets much more precarious for these people. All right, Brian, Owen, thank you very much on a very difficult topic.